morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Unity Church, Brooklyn Park. I don't care what's on TV about the state of the economy. I don't believe what most people see. What I know, I know to be. God is so good all the time. God is so good all the time. God is so good, so good, so good all the time. Well, search my faith, but not by sight. Cause what seems wrong today, tomorrow might seem right. All is well, and it's so good. And unfolding as it should. God is so good all the time. God is so good all the time. God is so good, so good, so good all the time. My God is so good through the highs and lows. Through the troubles and woes. Church of Overland Park. Happy Father's Day. Yes. Oh, we're so glad you chose to, to join us on, on this uh, Father's Day Sunday. To the, the fathers out there, we're glad you decided, especially you, to postpone the golf course for a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. I know. I know. 12.15. Okay. All right. Well, in, in the interest of Fred and his tea time, why don't you open us in, in okay. prayer? Okay. Let's do that. And so I invite you now to join me in just going within to that Christ center, to that place of peace that passes all understanding. And we begin this day by blessing all of our dear fathers, those who have guided and directed us, whether they're biological or not, for there is a, that father maternal or paternal energy within each of us. And so for each and every one of you, blessings and peace. And may you know the beauty of your strength and of your heart this day. And so now we continue to just open wide to the movement of spirit during this service for we are so grateful and so it is amen well since it is father's day and 
Reverend Jan and I decided to talk today about this idea of divine strength and, and how it is that we can move into a place of accessing and utilizing the strength that you are, I, I thought what I would do first is look at some of these, um, well, I guess the conventional images of what a, what a good, strong father, a good, strong male role model looks like uh, in, in today's society. So we've got, there's the first picture here. Um, now, see, what, what I noticed about this is, really, honestly, if you want the child to be successful in any sort of physical endeavor, you have to start young. You have to start real young getting them into that Olympic weight, weightlifting thing. And, and in fact, even though um, with Harper we're not working on weightlifting, uh, we have started working on, on performing and dancing. I can now, I'll look at her and go, Harper, jazz hands, and she does this. <laughs> I, I've been told the next thing to work on is big finish. So, so you have to start young. You have to start young and really motivate them with your energy and your excitement. Um, and then, of course, there's that spirit of competition that a good, strong individual is going to encourage in their child. So you have that really strong competitive spirit and that competitive nature, um, teaching them how, what it means to be a a strong individual that fights for things in their world. So, um, what I love about these pieces, this is all part of a series of, of art done by the, uh, the gentleman in, in the picture is actually the artist. His name is Dave Ingledow. Uh, and this is a series he did entitled World's Best Fathers. Um, and there's all sorts of wonderful pictures that he's taken of him and his daughter and, and uh, his wife was involved in, in this as well. So go online and look at some of them, but it, it's, it's really interesting as I was reading about him and what he does, he does this artwork because he, he said he noticed when he had kids, when he had his daughter, that there was this interesting view of what was expected of him as a strong individual on how to raise a strong child. And this appearance, this belief in the appearance of being strong that he noticed. And you know what the truth is? This isn't just limited to dads. It's not limited to fathers. All of us are expected to appear strong and self-assured and, and expected to have this strength that comes from within us regardless of our gender. It's just this sort of expectation. Oh, and, and I know you've heard, oh, look at how confident they are. Look at how strong of an individual that is. But how do we get that strength? Where does that divine strength come from? Well, today I want to take a look at, at perhaps one of the greatest kings that was known to, to the people of Israel, and that's David. But not just David himself, because there are so many stories about King David that, that you can pull from and you can learn lessons from, but, but specifically I want to look at the story of how David was called to become the king of Israel. And what it was about him that, that led God to say, yeah, that's the king. And so the story, it actually starts with the prophet Samuel. See, the prophet Samuel hears from God that, that this king exists. This king has been born. You'll find him. He lives in Bethlehem. He's one of the children of a, a man named Jesse. And I love how the Bible just assumes things. So that's one of Jesse's kids because we all know who Jesse was. But he goes to Bethlehem to find this new king. And I don't know how familiar you are with the Hebrew scriptures, but when a prophet shows up outside your village, you had reason to be a little bit afraid of what they were coming to tell you. Usually you'd made God mad and this prophet was coming to warn you, change your ways, or the fire and the brimstone comes. And so they were a little reluctant to let Samuel in because, you know, this hasn't changed in thousands of years. If we ignore the problem, it goes away. So once Samuel reassured them and told them that, no, I, I, I'm here in peace. I'm here to find our new king. They let him in. And so Samuel starts meeting with all of Jesse's sons. He had seven of them. And he's meeting with each, each son, one after the other. And each one is... Uh, physical, strong man, he's uh, wise and would be a wonderful leader. And, and with each meeting, God speaks through Samuel and says, no, that wasn't the king. Keep looking. 
And finally, finally, Samuel goes, okay, wait a minute. What, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. They're all strong. They all would be wonderful kings. What is going on? And God, God says something to Samuel. And actually, you know what? I'm going to just read it to you. Because I love the way the author of this, this text has, has God say this. This is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And the Lord looks on the heart. You see, the appearance that shows up in front of us, that's not what's important. That's not what the Lord or God is using to, to define what's going to make a great, strong king. God's looking at the heart. And the lesson we find from this, the lesson we can draw from just this one line is that when we focus on, on needing divine strength, physical strength, mental strength, those things in the world around us, when we focus on trying to appear like the world's greatest father was appearing, we always come up just that much short. Because this true strength and power comes from living life through our heart. Now, interestingly enough, Samuel says, okay, fine, it's not, not one of these men. And he asks Jesse, do you have any other children? And Jesse says, well, yeah, I mean, there's this David kid, but he's out with the sheep, and he's young, and it's not him. And Samuel says, bring him, bring him to me. When Samuel meets David, God says, yes, this is him. I know him by his heart. And David is widely regarded as a wise, a successful king, a generous king, not just in his strength on the battlefield, but also as a poet. He's credited with writing the majority of the Psalms. He's a character that our co-founder, Charles Fillmore, said represents divine love as it shows up in humanity. And so how do we access that strength of God? Not by worrying about how we appear, but by focusing on living through our hearts, living through love. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But for now, I'd like to invite you to stand and join with our song leaders in singing, I Am.
always love this time of greeting one another. And so as I was giving consideration as to who it was that I was going to be speaking about today, over these last four or five weeks or so, it's changed many times. Jan Chapman kept sending me messages, do you have your person yet? <laughs> and I said, no. And then it was, well, maybe, I'm thinking about, and then it'd be a little bit later, no, it's changed again. <laughs> and so it was really a process that I was going through because, you know, was it physical strength, mental strength, spiritual strength? What was it? that I really wanted to talk about today. And then I, I was, got very clear that it was that strength that of being able to stand and to be different when the world may be saying or calling for something else. And so it was with that that I came to choosing Jesus and the Beatitudes. For I think that that most clearly represents for me strength through love. And the, the Beatitudes are at, right at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And it, they were really given as instructions to the disciples. And there's nine Beatitudes, and they're divided into two different groups. The first four talk about conditions. And the, the last five talk about behaviors. So we're going to look at the, the, first, the first four, first of all, the, um, the conditions. For this was now Roman society and the way that strength was seen, it was all about power, status, and wealth. That was the way of Roman society. But the people of God and what Jesus was teaching about was that strength came through the poor and the powerless. For there was a, a gift in that, and it was coming from a different energy, a different place within. It wasn't a show on the outside. But rather, it was a strength in the inner person. And so, during this time, the second part of this, of each of these blessings, was that there was a promise, a blessing, that would come, that would reverse these imperial rules. And so I'm going to go now and read through the, um, the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses one through six. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be fulfilled. And so this talks about that deeper quality, that deeper quality within. And then the next five we're talking about changes in behaviors, a different way of, of living, of being. 
And one of the things that was, that was really clear was that whenever there was an, a, ch a challenge to the elite power, that there would be persecution. And how willing are we to really stand for what it is that we believe? How true are we to them? So let's, let's take a look. Continuing on in the fifth chapter, verses 7 through 12. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the Beatitudes were a teaching to the disciples that were calling them to live in a very different way. And so whether it was in the time of King David or the time of Jesus or today, it's still all about the love and the strength that comes from living from that place of love. Something's calling me Something's calling me Something's calling me A little bit deeper than I've ever been before Feels like I'm walking on marbles Can't still the earth beneath my feet Deeper than I 
Well, thank you, Poncho, and, and all of you. That is absolutely one of my favorite songs. I, um, well, so much about that, but I, I love that idea of, of going deeper, of being called deeper, because that's what unity is all about. It's about going deeper, not just here at Unity Church of Overland Park, but unity the world over. It's about taking this idea that that the Lord, that, that God works through our hearts, that God judges us not by our appearance or how we look on the outside, but by our hearts, and then taking that deeper into your life and getting to that place where you can really live through your heart in every moment, where you can really live in that presence of love, that healing, harmonizing presence of love. It's about going from that place where you know, okay, I, I need to be strong in the face of this seemingly impossible or even difficult task and saying, okay, I, I get there through love. So how do we do that? Well, I can show you how I do that. Um, this is something that I've, I've started doing to, to remind myself to live through my heart. Now, I showed you the, the pictures earlier about the world's best father, and I've got one more I'd like to, like to show you if you're okay with it. So let's go ahead and... Aww. Now, now, this is my oldest daughter, Harper and Hayden, and, and I think you recognize the person holding them. Um, but what you should know about this picture is that Harper is so in love with this little baby, it's just not even, even funny. In fact, we have to work on, on loving your baby sister too much. Um, and she's like laying on top of her, kissing her. And, but she'll come up to us and, and hold her hands out. And, Do you want to hold your baby sister? Yes. And so, oh, okay, we get, her, we get her into our lap, get her situated, and we put Hayden in front of her and let her... Let her hold Hayden. And, and usually, this lasts about 10 seconds. She gets 10 seconds of, of Hayden, and then all done. <laughs> like, oh, OK, you're, you're all dead. It takes longer to get her into your hands. But, <laughs> but this time, she'd been holding her for about five minutes, just looking at her sister, kissing her sister. There's this look of love on her eyes. In fact, the only reason she's really looking at the camera is because she noticed mommy taking a picture. And, and mommy happened to catch it just about two seconds before Harper went cheese. But in this moment, the feeling of love, that, that feeling of living through your heart, I mean, it was palpable. You could feel it. And let me tell you, the strength that filled me when I was sitting there holding them, you can't imagine. So how do you call on divine strength when you need it? You're connecting with your heart, connecting with that presence of love within you. So one simple way to do that is to identify a memory, identify an experience. This is what mine looks like. And to let that memory or that experience remind you to live your life through your heart. To connect with that presence of love that's within you. Now, I don't know what your memory could look like, what that experience of love, that, that pure, true experience of love looks like for you. And I'm, I'm not going to stand here and try and define it for you. And say, well, love looks like this or it looks like that because well, then I would be judging by appearances. And if I remember correctly, we were told that that presence of God judges through the heart. So it could look like whatever for you. I'm also, and I'll give you a second here to think about what that might be, but, 
But I also would just say this is, this is one of those things, where I think about one of those moments in your life where you felt true, pure love, that love of God, and then you start thinking about all the moments, going, oh, well, no, it can't be that one, because then you can change your moment later. We're all filled with, with times of divine love. So don't worry about trying to find the perfect moment of divine love. Just allow a memory to come to your mind. So I'll give you time to do that. Think about, think about your happy place, your, your feeling of love. Silence is fun, isn't it? And if nothing comes to you right now, that's fine. Keep thinking. It'll come to you. Now, certainly, you can take time in meditation. You can focus on that memory. You can remember what that feeling was like. And I guarantee you that will reset you to living through your heart in any moment. But you don't have to just go into meditation. You don't have to spend a lot of time in the stillness with this practice. You see, when you have that, that memory, that moment like that, when you notice yourself out of alignment, when you notice yourself, you know, oh, I, this is going to be difficult. I need a little bit of strength. All you have to do is close your eyes, take that breath in, and picture that image in your mind. And allow that to reset you, to recenter you. See, these quick little tune-ups are available to you whenever you want them. You don't have to stop in the line at the grocery store and, okay, I need to go into meditation. It can be just that quick. Now, of course, these tune-ups are more effective if you spend time in the stillness and the silence on a regular basis and, and meditate on them. So let's take the opportunity to do that right now. If you would just go ahead and prepare, get comfortable for a time of meditation. And as you do, we can begin simply by breathing in. Becoming conscious and aware of the breath that is flowing through our body. <clears throat> Taking this moment to remember the divine light, the divine love of God within us. To become aware of that divine spark. And so we first take this opportunity to acknowledge the divinity within us. To know in this moment that our true nature is divine. And now we move from a place of knowing to a place of feeling. We move down to our heart. And in this moment, we allow that memory, that feeling of true, pure love to flow through us. we focus on everything about that experience, the sights, the smells, the feelings. We allow that experience to play across our mind in high definition. And we allow ourselves to feel, to truly feel the love that was present in that moment. 
as we rest in the silence. as we allow our attention to return to this room. It carries with it the feeling of pure love, the love of God, the divine love that we are. And with that love comes a commitment, a commitment to live our lives through our hearts, seek and share that presence of love in our world and to commit to recentering ourselves when necessary because the true strength that we need the true strength our world is looking for comes from our heart comes from love and nowhere else And so it is with that commitment in our hearts that we joyfully say, thank you, God. When we are open to spirit living through our lives, love is that harmonizing result. David understood this. And it was Jesus that was truly the greatest and best example of this for us. I think of verse in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where it says, where faith, hope, and love abide. And we can add other attributes and qualities of strength or wisdom or understanding. Whatever we add, the second part will always be true, where it says, and the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. And when it, we allow ourselves, no matter what the outer circumstances may be, it doesn't matter. When we come from that place of love, that truly is our strength. We saw it in the Beatitudes. We see it in, we saw it in David. In so many different ways again and again in the Bible. We see that lived out, that the way of, of the people of God is not through wealth and status and power as exemplified by the Romans, but in meekness and gentleness and a true knowing of where and what is the real strength. And so let us remember that when we come from this heart of love, the very natural outpicturing of that is prayer, to be a prayer-filled person. And within that, 
And because of that, we live from divine strength. God bless you, and happy Father's Day. <laughs>
and at the bottom of the page you can roll through the various funds um, to see which one you'd like to donate to. So highlight what you'd like and then hit done. You can make this gift recurring or just hit next if you want it to be a one-time gift. You'll notice your phone number automatically fills in. So then you just have to enter the other personal information, your email, your name, of course, and uh, address. All of this information is held on the secure server, so it's all protected. Then click Next, and this is where you'll enter your financial information, uh, the debit card number, if you're using that. Uh, if you want to use a bank account, you can do that here, but in this example, we're using a debit card. You'll hit Give and wait for it to process. Then you'll be asked to select a four-digit PIN number, and that'll keep all your information secure. They'll send you a verification email, which you can access from this screen if you click the link indicated. You can also access your receipt by going to your text message screen, and there'll be a link there to your receipt. Click on that, and you can view it. Now, that was a first-time, one-time-only registration process, so anytime you want to give in the future, just go to your text message screen and send a text message with the word GIVE. Then wait for a prompt asking you for the amount. Now, if you get eager and you enter the amount before you get that prompt, it's okay. They'll just make you type in the number again, as they did here in this example. Then they'll ask you what fund. Now, don't um, click on the words of the fund. You simply type in the number in front of the fund. So number one for 9 a.m. service, as in this example, and send that. Then they'll send you your receipt, and that's all there is to it. So to recap, once you've completed this one-time only registration, all you need to do to give in the future is send the word give as a text message, then wait for the prompt asking for the amount. You'll type in the amount and send that. The next prompt will ask you to select a fund, so type in the number of the fund you'd like and send that. Then they'll send you a receipt, and that's all there is to it. Giving couldn't be any easier than with text to give. Yeah. In fact, in the time that she was recapping, I've got my receipt back already. So, um, just a wonderful way to, to make this process just that much easier. And if you missed the phone number or if you want any other, any other questions answered, Jan will be downstairs in the lobby after the service to answer some of those questions for you. But for right now, let's just hold our gifts and our tithes in our hands. And we take this opportunity to bless those gifts, to bless them as an expression of love that we are. To know in this moment that we are grateful, yes, for these gifts, but that we are also grateful for the expression of God through us that they represent. And so for that, we move forward now, ready to shine the light of love that we are. And so it is. Amen.
to a different